and we're in the Exodus, the 20th chapter, we're looking at the Ten Commandments, which is the Magna Carta of the Mosaic Law of the priest nation of Israel. And the Ten Commandments is broken down into two sections. There's the God side and the man side of the Ten Commandments. The God side is the first four commandments, and the man side is then from five to ten. What I'm interested in is what's stated. This will we'll introduce the subject tonight and continue it next week. But what, we're, what I'm interested in is the second commandment. And what is described there? The second commandment begins, begins in verse four, and it goes through six. And you shall not make for yourself an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. You know, Paul picked this subject up in Romans 1 for background. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity, here it is, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, we're going to refer to that as parenting, the Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. It's parenting. On the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. Here's the, that's a negative side. Here's the positive side. There's a negative and a positive side to the second commandment. Here's the positive side. But showing loving kindness to thousands See that thousands? That's generations. Notice the negative. Third and fourth, right? We're gonna we're going to step in. When it gets to the third or fourth generation, then I'm gonna have to intervene. And that means discipline. Um visiting that that's verse five. Verse six, but showing loving kindness. This is God is going to do one thing, then he's going to do another, but showing love and kindness to thousands of generations to those who love me. Those who, who hate me, I'm going to step in on the third and fourth, right? But those who love me, I'm going to show loving kindness. I'm not going to visit the discipline on them. I'm going to show them loving kindness for those who love me. So there's the second commandment deals with a love-hate relationship with God. You understand that? That's very important. And that's where we're going with our subject matter tonight, based on Rebecca's family's parenting that falls under this uh, concept. Okay? Second commandment. There's a positive and a negative uh, about worship with God. <clears throat> So we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll study what this means. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess your sin if necessary. It would be necessary if you're a believer and you're carnal, because you can't you can't get anything from the Bible, which is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living, if you're carnal. That is, in the flesh. Because the Spirit is what teaches you the Word of God. So, what I want you to do tonight, those who are with it, visiting with the Internet, as well as those who are attending with us, is classroom etiquette. How do I know if I'm in carnality? Well, personal sin. What do I do? You confess it. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That sin could be in at least three categories. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins or mental attitude sins. 
my responsibility under 1 John 1, 9 is to confess my sin through my priesthood. And he has promised that he will forgive and cleanse <clears throat> me from all unrighteousness. So I'm going to give you a moment in your priesthood to take care of business. It's your responsibility to examine yourself <clears throat> and then have your own prayer about God teaching you something that's relevant to your life and your ministry to other people. <clears throat> and so, our Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for your love, mercy, and grace that flows to our life as children of God based on our conversion through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are thankful for that. We're thankful that you always treat us in, in love and a covenant relationship between you and us as children of God. We're not children of God because we're born human. We're children of God because we've been born again. We've been adopted into the family of God and indwelt by the, second, the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and when we confess our sins, it brings us back into the privilege, Father, of sanctification under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we're thankful for that. It is my prayer that the people have prepared themselves both, both on the internet as well as here in the assembly to have prepared ourselves properly for this Bible study. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I put on your paper at the very top up there in the introduction uh, how you could read out the chapter 20 of Exodus to look at all of the Ten Commandments. We're interested in the second commandment. And I'll tell you why we're interested because of the concept they should be interested. The old covenant believers were interested in this because it was a life living experience. <clears throat> and I'll tell you why it was important to the old covenant people. Because if you violated any of the Magna Carta, if you, if you violated any of the Ten Commandments, it depend, and especially on the d divine side. Now there, there were, there were social laws and moral laws and all that on the human side of it. But on the divine side of it, if you violated those four on the divine side as, a, as, a, as an individual, you could be disciplined. Collectively, you could be disciplined as a nation. Therefore, violation of the second commandment that I'm interested in, but any violation of any of the four on the divine side could bring you it was always the violation of that side first that corrupts the man side. Always. When you throw God under the bus, then everybody's in a bunch of trouble. So the reason the divine side is important to us, because if you violate the divine side of this, and I'm interested in the second command, but if you, divine the, if you violate it, this is what is behind the five cycles of divine discipline. Absolutely is what behind it. The five cycles of divine discipline was for the priest nation of Israel, and we've studied that a great deal. But violation, if it was critical, was the critical part to the five cycles of divine discipline on the priest nation of Israel, which you can study, if you would like, out of, on your own, uh, Deuteronomy 28. In Donna, in and here's what's interesting. In Deuteronomy 28, when he lays out the five cycles of dis discipline, he begins in chapter 28. In the first 14 verses, he gives you five cycles of blessings. This is if you, if you love God and obey his commandments, then here's what you get. And he's talking to the priest nation of Israel. Here's what you get. Then he comes to the cursing side of it. That's chapter 28, verses 15 through 20, or, or well, to 68 at least, so you can get through the fifth cycle. Then there are cursings, five cycles of cursing. 
And it would do you well, if you're interested in this kind of history, it would be interesting to look at all that. Because if you're, going to, if you're going to read out of the Old Testament and even into the Gospels, you're going to find that. Because in 70 AD, Israel is 70 AD, Israel is going to go under a fifth cycle of discipline. And it's going to remain there to the second coming of Christ. So historically, this is kind of really important. When you're studying the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the, the people in that day are under this covenant law. Christ dies on the cross, is buried and raised from the dead, ascends back to the Father. Now we're under a new covenant. You understand that? This story comes, but, but concepts remain, not necessarily the directive will of God that says one, two, three, four, five, but the concept is there. So that's what's important to us. And next week, I'll talk about how the concept works. <clears throat> but it's important. So when you, that's in Deuteronomy 28. When you look to Deuteronomy 32, in verses 15 through 28, and I want you to write this passage down too, because some of you are historians, you like this information. Write down next to Deuteronomy 32, write down Isaiah 44, 1 and 2. Um, Jeshurun, you're going to find a word in these passages. J E S H U N mm, R. I don't know. Let me. I think I wrote this letter, word down. Uh, there's not. There's not an N there. Uh, right there. Jeshurun is the word. You're going to see that. And you're going to see that in Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, 1 and 2 is going to explain what that word means. But you're going to run across that word in Deuteronomy 32. If, if you was to study it, you would. You'd run across that word. And in this passage, they're dealing with idolatry and violation of the second commandment. That's why Deuteronomy 32, I put that there. And it, that you're going to run into that word. And it means the upright one, the upright one. And it refers to the Israel that is looking for the coming of Christ. It is the Israel. It is the, it is the positive volition of Israel who is looking for the coming of Christ. But anyhow, that's, it's just a kind of interest. I thought I'd give it to you. And in Deuteronomy 32, they're going to tell you that what is behind idolatry is demonism. They're going to tell you that. Now, what's interesting, that if you have a study Bible, then you're, if you was to read 1 Corinthians 10, 20, where Paul talks about how demonism can affect the Eucharist of the church. He talks about that. Don't drink the cup of demons. At the same time, don't get engaged with demons. At the same time, as a Christian, you're going to church and take the Eucharist, and then you go over to, to the, the demonic altar and, and play homage to him. You can't, you can't, because there was a lot of that going on. You can't pay homage to both. And so, but there, if, if you had a study Bible, if you looked up references you would find Deuteronomy 32 if you have a good study Bible. If you was to read 1 Corinthians 10, 20 and look at a reference, you know how to use your references there, you would find Deuteronomy 32. Uh, that, that would be his proof text. That would be a proof text, what we call proof texting. You would find that there. It's just kind of interesting. I mean, you know, Paul making his argument over here with idolatry and how, how destructive it is. And, and he makes a reference to Deuteronomy 32, um, which follows, follows Deuteronomy 28. That's his kind of interesting history, little pieces you put together. Uh, that's, that's important to our lesson. Uh, as we look, I'm going to look at four things tonight to introduce you to the fourth generation's of how Rebecca's family was part of it, how their family was part of it. 
And, and we see the concept, even though this is before the Mosaic law came into, uh, you know, it, this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is before Moses and before the law came into existence. So the concept is what's important. Uh, for us, and that's why we have this laid out by the law in Deut- in uh, Exodus, because of what. That's all right. Just leave. What's been going on? All right. So I'm going to look at four 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 a- a- aspects of it. Point number one: the second commandment is based on the doctrinal principle, and this is really important because this is going to apply to your life as well. The second commandment is based on the doctrinal principle of the exclusive covenant love relationship between God and his people. You see it on your paper? Well, that's so important. It is, listen to me, it's a covenant relationship. It's a covenant love relationship. That's why this is really important. The second commandment, listen, the second commandment is a love-hate commandment. Agreed? Yeah, we just... (laughs) <laughs> we just read that. Now, here's what's interesting. In Jeremiah, put your eyes on Jeremiah 31 because that's the new covenant, or the, or the prophecy of a new covenant. So let, let's go to Jeremiah 31. I want to show you this a moment because I want to point out a point. I want to make a point. 31, 31, 31, 31. Um, 31, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with your fathers in the day I took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt. That's the Mosaic law. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them. Do you hear that? He was a husband to him. That's a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship. It's a covenant relationship. And it's established by God himself. It's established by God himself. Marriage is a covenant relationship. And it and listen, for it to work, it's based on God's love, God's salvation, and God's word, if you want it to work. Right. Now, see, and, and he says, listen, this is important. It, this is what the new covenant, this, this is, we're, Jer, Jeremiah 31, we're talking about a new covenant. And he says, they broke, I was a husband. I was in a marriage relationship with Israel. And they, they continuously broke my covenant. They, they went under, went under d- d- the five cycles of discipline. 722 B.C., the North Kingdom went under. South Kingdom went under in 586 and again in 70. You think we learn anything? Well, we got a short memory, but listen, sometimes that short memory goes four or 500 years. But history has a way of repeating itself because people, they are what they are. So, when we come to the new when we come to the new covenant let's go to let's go to Ephesians now we're seeing the new covenant days are coming now we're in the new covenant and the new covenant the days are still coming because Christ is coming again well here we are in Ephesians 5 and we have the the son now in the kingdom all right it's not the father now it's the son and Jesus told so many parables, and we, we looked at a couple parables last night where this was an issue. In the fifth chapter, like on your paper, verse 23, 24, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church. He, he, he's the husband to the church. Right? He's the husband to the church. And so this goes on. I gave you several passages, and then it winds up in verse 32. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. 
Nevertheless, let each individual among you, he's talking to believers, also love his own wife even as himself and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband. You see, marriage in the Old Testament and New Testament, there's a concept. And the concept is a covenant relationship of love that's based on God. It's an unconditional love covenant. Marriage is. Now, you don't have to get married. You don't have to do that. (laughs) But if you do that, then you're held accountable. You don't have to have children. But if you do, then you're held accountable. You see? There are concepts and principles that God has established in that. See, the problem is the church has forgot to tell the people that this is a covenant relationship. So they don't treat it like a covenant relationship and they don't treat each other in the covenant as a covenant relationship. Listen, the covenant relation between the believer and God is a, is a, is a two-way relationship it's a two-way relationship it's not a one-way right i mean how many times god have to tell you he loves you and i care for you and i take care of you and i you know it's it's a a covenant marriage is a covenant the church is a covenant with christ the old testament it was god And they were in a covenant with the coming of Christ that would bring this all into. We live in a day when the Old Testament covenant people would have longed to been able to be in. And we we poo-hoo this stuff. We don't take any of this stuff serious. My ministry has always been to a pivot. There's not been a day in my ministry that I haven't ministered to a pivot. Well, in this church, (laughs) I've been here 44 years and I've always ministered to a pivot. I've never ministered to anything else. Everything else doesn't stay. It's just way too, too much responsibility brought into their life. They'd rather fly by the seat of their pants and be disciplined all the time. Then they know how to live. They don't know how to live by grace. They don't know how to live by the power of the spirit. They live in the flesh and they don't live in the spirit. I've had a high privileged ministry. There's nobody knows this more than I do. I've had a highly privileged ministry to minister the pivot and an enormous responsibility because I know that I've known it from the start. And it, it, it places a lot of it places a lot of responsibility on me that a lot of other pastors don't have and don't, don't, don't seem to care. Um, but I've always ministered to pivot. And wherever I'm ministering today around the world through the Internet, I'm still ministering to pivot. I'm, I'm, I, only people who are serious in the Word of God stay with me. The fluffers, the, you know, the fly-by-nighters, they don't last because it, it, there's way too much responsibility in a covenant relationship. It's not all God. It's you and God. It's a it's a hundred percent God and a hundred percent you, and it works great. In marriage, a hundred percent you and a hundred percent Him, and it works great. And we're a long way from there. But let me tell you, there's one group that has a, a real shot at this. And, and it's what's going to hold this nation together, and it's people like you. There are a lot of Christians, but there's few of them serious as a pivot. And that's always been true. Listen, we're not. We're, every generation has a pivot. That's what makes this thing work. Sometimes it's small and sometimes it's large, but it's always a pivot. Well, 
in Exodus 20, verse 5, you shall, you shall not worship. Here's responsibility. You should cut. There's a responsibility covenant relationship with God in, under the old covenant. You shall not worship them idols. That's not changed by the way to serve them for. I watch this for. I am the Lord. I am a jealous God. Let me tell you something. When you read Exodus 34, 14, that's on your paper. You ought to circle it later. Read it. Do you know what? Do you know what God told Moses to tell the people? He said, one of my names is jealous. He didn't say I am. He said, one of my names. In in Exodus 34 of 14, one of the names of God is jealous, like God is love. I found that to be interesting. In Deuteronomy 4, 23 through 31, when you read that, you will see that God is two things. On the one hand, he's a consuming fire. That's when he's the judge. And yet, he's a compassionate God. And a lot of people really have trouble with that. Well, God's a consuming fire. Why would I have a reason to him? Because he's a compassionate God. That's why. So when you, when you come to the law, you understand this. Especially when you're looking at the Mosaic Law. You understand that? Look, at now we understand. Here's how we understand it. We do understand this, that he disciplines you on the one hand. Listen, he can, and he'll discipline you pretty stern all the way unto death. You right? That's a consuming fire. I mean, he can become, he can become a consuming fire. On the other hand, he's a compassionate God. And here's how we, here's how we explain that to people. Uh, in the in the church age, for God so loved the world. All right, John three sixteen. I mean, I mean, just every little kid. You know, that's a complicated verse, and it amazes me. Little kids pick that up just like that. My kids, it was one of those that they just, whoa, I like that verse, and they just learned that. There's a lot. There's twenty five words in that. That's a big verse to memorize. The kids don't have a problem with it at all. Boom. Now I see it with Angie's kids. You know, that four-year-old, boom, got it right there. And the little girl's right after trying to figure it all out, you know, because her brother's got it. She figures she should be able to get it. But that passage, and that's a big passage. There's just something about that passage that just clicks. And it, and I would suppose, wouldn't you, it's for God so loved the world. Because they, you can explain that to little kids, and they got that just like that. They got it. The rest of it's a little difficult. But they can get that first part right off the bat. So that's kind of interesting to me. But, but listen, in 1 John, in 1 John 4, 8, 9, we're told that God is love. God is love. And so, where does the jealous God come into when they hate him? See, in that second commandment, you shall not worship them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the equity of the fathers on the children, on the third and on the fourth generations of those who hate me. How is it possible that you could hate me when I, my 100% of my character is love? How is it possible you hate me? And it, and it means to hate without a cause. It means to, to hate that I found something better. I can tell you why people, as a rule, leave, leave here. They leave for a lot of excuses because blame is a natural thing. But most of them, most of them leave because the, being a part of a pivot is a lot of responsibility. It becomes very weighty. It's very difficult. Well, listen, the pivot carries the whole. If you're a pivot in a nation, you carry the whole nation. God's favor works through the pivot. Always has and always will. 
violation of the second commandment that we're talking about today involved idolatrous substitution of devotion towards a covenant love relationship with God. Jesus warned Israel about this very thing in, in Matthew 6, 24. Here's what he said. He said, no, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. People are always struggle with this word mammon. But let me tell you a good way to remember it. It's what, where, where your treasure is is where your heart is. It's a treasure idea. Where your treasure is is where your heart is. Or your heart is where your treasure is. And it means that you've turned your heart away from God as the primary source and force in your life onto something else, a substitute. The treasure you put in place doing the right thing with God. It is whatever you have put in place of serving God and being faithful to him, being honorable, doing the right thing for God. You leave doing the right thing for God to go do your own little thing that you know God would be displeased with. He would not go with you on that date. He would not be engaged with you on what you're doing. You know that. Kids know it if they have any parental training in their life. Or like me, I didn't have parental training in religion, but I did have in morals. My people were just wonderful moral people. You didn't steal, didn't lie, didn't cheat, didn't do all those things. Because that's not being a good neighbor. That's, that's farm kid. You helped each other. You didn't steal from anybody. You didn't cheat anybody. How would you like them to do it to you? They didn't say how it would affect God, but how would you like if somebody took that stuff that you've worked hard? When You know, if I wanted something extra, I had to, I had to do, do a little extra something to get it. Then how, as soon as I get it, then grand, my grandfather would start this little deal. How would you like if somebody stole your whatever I just got? Well, I wouldn't like it. Well, then now you know how it would be. So no one can serve two masters. You cannot do this. You cannot. Listen, you ought to circle that. You cannot. Oh, I can if I want to. Yeah, I know, but you cannot. <clears throat> you cannot. You can't, you can't serve both of them. You can serve one of them, but you can't serve both of them. Oh, yeah, you can, but you can only serve one of them. You understand that? You only serve one at a time. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. And he tells you why and explains it to you. A further account on this is Luke 16, well worth your time sometime to study, Luke 16, 1 through 13. And then here's one. In, in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 12 through 20. Does, can you see that 20? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it should have went to 20. Okay. And you always look for clues when you're studying a passage. Agreed? You look for what I call markers. Let me tell you, you could not miss the marker, and yet I'm telling you, so many people violate this, it is unbelievable. Here is the marker, the body. It is used eight times in that verse. It dominates the subject, your body. Your body. And why your body is not your own. And why you can't do with it as a believer what you want to do with it. And I, I swanee. The church throws that out. Throws that passage under the bus more than I've ever seen in my life. And it's been that way ever since I've been a pastor. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen. As if that passage never existed, and the primary subject of that entire passage is your body. 
He's talking to Christians. And that's because they've used their body in a sexual way in idolatry. God says, don't do that. They go like, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I know. I know. I know. But you, listen, if you're going to go out there on your own, then you ought to study up what venereal disease is all about. That might be a good place to start on your little journey alone. Not to say anything about discipline. If I was a parent and I had kids... I have them, but they're all grown. Now I'm into grandkids. You start teaching. What do you start teaching them? When they discover some things about their own body. How about that? How about that? I know it makes you uncomfortable uh, to hear this stuff. I know. But here's the truth. If you read 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, you got to do something with it. What God wants you to do, he lays it out. He wants you to be honorable with it. This becomes responsibility on your part. Just pay attention. Eight times in this passage, he talks about the body. I make my grandkids and stuff, I make them pull all those eight times, put them list there and tell me what he said about it. When I used to teach young people all the time, that's what I did with them. This is one of the great passages that's violated every day, not only from the very young, but from the very old. They don't give a hoot about the word of God when it comes to what they want. Their pleasure overruns. You can't serve two masters. You either become your own or God becomes it. Why don't you leave it to God to do all that? In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all, not some, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength or might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them. Here's what's important. You shall teach them diligently to your children, your sons, and you shall talk of them, the word of God, you shall talk the word of God when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way with your children, when you lie down, and when you rise up. How about that? That's a whole lot of teaching in it. Now, we do do that as parents, but how important is the word of God in this discussion is the issue. How important is the word of God? You, you're, you're going to do all these things. You're going to talk. You're going to sit. You're going to walk. You're going to lie down. Get up. How important is the word of God in the course of these discussions with your children? It ought to be essential. And boy, I'll tell you how it pays off is as they begin to make their own decisions in their own life behind your back or not in your presence is a pretty powerful idea. And then to be able to see your children grow up and, and train up a child and the way he will go and when he's old, he'll not depart from it, just becomes a crown to you to wear, right? I mean, it's an enormous, when you see it, you just, I'm not just talking about getting an education. I'm talking about the whole package now. What a tremendous thing that is. <clears throat> I tell you, you know, when you set, you, you, you're able to set, you know, for me, it's to go to church and preach, and my kids are there. That's, that's as good as gifts. And when we sit at the d dining table or we go on a uh, go on a trip together or whatever we do, I'd rather be with my kids than anybody in the whole wide world. I love being with my kids. I mean, we just have fun. I would. There's nobody I'd rather be with. I love them. I mean, I just have more fun. I just laugh. I have to go to bed at some time. And I come out, they just make me laugh so much my stomach hurts. I just have a good time. I just, I couldn't imagine being with anybody other than them. 
I wouldn't take a trip with anybody. But there are a few people I have with, but they were the same kind of people. But anyhow, I mean, and so there's some responsibility. We do this in the new covenant with, with new covenant teaching, not old covenant teaching. But the principle and the concepts are there, and they're very important. Here's the second point. The fourth generation's curse is described as a jealous God, a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the parents or fathers on the children on the third and the fourth. Well, what about the first and second? Well, he's, he's getting a chance to recover. By the time he gets to the third and fourth, we're on it. Now he's visiting what? He's visiting the iniquity. Did I put the, uh, did I write the Hebrew word for iniquity? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember, you read from the right to the left, <clears throat> but it's A-O-N in Hebrew. It refers to willful violation of a direct will of God resulting in legal guilt. In other words, <clears throat> when God brings discipline upon your life, there has already been enough time to bring legal guilt. You understand? In other words, why am I being disciplined? I don't understand why I'm being disciplined. I oh, yeah, you do. Don't you kid me. You know, the, when I was ra raising kids, there just was always a comment, and it, it, the, the, I see my kids do it as, as adults now. When somebody's, it's obvious that they, they, they're in a mess, the first thing you know, like, hmm, have you, have you confessed your sin? Is this divine discipline? If sufferings in your life is from one, three causes, I, I preach that more than, I mean, if I gave him a bowl of cereal, that probably was with it. <laughs> now I see them working out. The, the, their kids get into some kind of suffering. The first thing they do is say, sit down, let's talk about this. And they go through the, the, same, the same routine. I don't know if everybody does it, but might be good refers to the willful violation of the direct will of God resulting in legal guilt. And a good example of this is Eli. Now, we've studied Eli. You remember old Eli? Uh, the old dad. First, first Samuel 3rd chapter, verses 10 through uh, 14. You remember his two, two terrible sons <laughs> that he just, you know, had to find a job for him, so he hired him, right? That nobody else would hire him. They were slugs. And so he brings a man, puts him in the church. At, in the worship area of it. And when they got into iniquity, he would, listen, and as a parent, he wouldn't do his parenting of them. Remember that? He, and the Lord rebuked him over it. And so you can read about that in that passage. And if you remember, the Lord said, listen, I'm going to bring it down on you, and it's going to be terrible. When I bring it, I'm going to bring it because he was in a place of authority. I'm going to bring it heavy on it. It's going to affect a whole lot of people when it hits. And you remember he was at war? You remember that? And uh, got killed? Yeah, got wounded and sat on and fell over and bro broke his neck or something. You know, Sorry about that. But uh, And uh, the news reached one of the son's wife was pregnant. The when the news got that what, what had happened is the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by the enemy. God had allowed the Ark of the, allowed the Ark of the God. And so she, she called the child Ichabod, which means the glory of Israel is departed. All of that, all of this is part of visiting the iniquity business. And that, 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 that was his grandson. That you got, never got to see. Do not miss the positive comparison in the second commandment showing loving kindness to thousands of generations to those who love me because this whole, whole second command is about who you love and who you hate. And you, you can't serve two masters because this is the way it works. You, you may say, well, I still love God. Yeah. Mm -mm. Can't serve two masters. I don't see you serving... I see you serving one. <laughs> you nod to the other, but serve one. You serve one and nod. I call it the nod to God group that comes on Sunday. You nod to God. I don't mean everybody. Some people can't come. I don't mean, mean to disparage you. I'm just saying that 
they go do their own thing. They live in iniquity. <laughs> and then and they think they got the best of both worlds. They got the flesh and the spirit. They went, no, you ain't. You ain't got the best. You, ain't got, you got the best of the world. <laughs> you ain't got the best of the world, but you ain't got the best of both worlds. What's the purpose of the law? Tell, tell me what's the purpose of the law. Jesus. Leads you to Christ, right? Galatians 3.24, you knew where it was? Better know where it is. Because people challenge you, what's the purpose of the law? It's to lead you to Christ. If you get to Christ, you don't need what? Then you don't need the law because it's fulfilled in him. If you're in him, the law is fulfilled in you. Don't have to fall. It's already fulfilled in you because it's fulfilled in Christ and you're in Christ. Jesus, in Matthew 22, he tries to tell Israel that the entire law is summed up in one word. You know what that one word was? Love. And he explained it under old covenant terms. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, upon these two commandments, hang all the law. This is the key word. Now, when we come to the new covenant, we don't go there. Where we go is 1 Corinthians 13, where love is explained, how God loved the world, how uh, he demonstrated his love towards us, and we were still sinners. Christ died for us, and the whole love system is now switched to how it works under the new covenant is through Jesus Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13 is a magnificent passage on this. And, and listen, where's the love of God operating? Inside the believer. Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is poured out into the believer at the point of salvation under the new covenant. The, whole, the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into the life, the, the life of a believer when he takes presence. When he takes his presence at point of salvation. That's a powerful idea. That's new covenant thinking. See, we have the love of God in us to love God and to love other people with the love of God, not love that represents him, the actual love of God. And by this type of love, all men will know that you're a disciple of Christ. And sometimes that's difficult. It's not impossible. But sometimes it's difficult because we fight our nature. We fight our nature. We've been hurt and all of that. Instead of go to God for healing, we think we're just going to fight it out and get some kind of resolution and then I'll fix it. No, you fix it as soon as you're wounded. Don't wait to fix it. You fix it right then. Boom, get it fixed so that you can give people unconditional love. And you don't have to phony baloney it. You don't have to conjure it up. You have to go inside to get it. Inside you, the Holy Spirit is an artesian well to give you all those necessary things by a grace principle. Right? Fruit of the Spirit is first one out of the, out of the box. Love. I mean, we live in such a phenomenal age. When I write these things and do this and I show you how it was and how it is now, Holy catfish, who would want to be, live over here when you could live over here in this magnificent palace of, of, of the divine stuff of God? I mean, we live, as, as, as believers, we live in phenomenal times. The point number three, last week we studied Rebecca's family in Mesopotamia. We studied her family, and this is important to the second commandment which was an example of the violation of the second commandment visit at the example visiting the iniquity of parenting old man cosmos diabolical pa parenting on their children it's an example of it for example tedra tedra which was the father of abraham he had three sons a abram which was his original name abram nahor and, and haran after Haran and Terah died, Abraham left, right? Le left Mesopotamia, leaving only the Shemite Nahor in Mesopotamia. You with that? Now, that's really important to the background of this story of the patriarchs. 
You got that? All right. That's very important. You can read about that in Genesis 11, 26 to 32, as is on your paper. Then remember this. Abraham sends for a wife from Nahor for Isaac. Agreed? You remember that great story in uh, Genesis 24? Uh, Rebekah's father, Bethuel, and her brother Laban are two key players in the patriarch people. Isaac is going to marry Rebecca through this wonderful process. And you know what I love about the story there is the guy that Abraham sent out was just a phenomenal guy, wasn't he? The guy who sent out to find a, a bride from the family of Nahor uh, for Isaac. And, and in verses, you write these down because you ought to go back and read them. In chapter 24, I gave you a lot of verses, but here are the verses I, I would like to have you go back and read one time to see divine guidance in the selection of a mate. This is the one I always gave my kids. Verse 27, this is 24, 27, and 37, 41. Th this is so phenomenal because he keeps telling them why he's there, who sent him, and what he's looking for. And it's all about God. It's all about God. And, and that, this is one of the most powerful little passages that you could study. Rebecca was brought into the patriarch family by this agreement uh, and brought her family's parenting skills and problems with her. We know it when we meet his, her brother Laban. Which we talked about last week. Then later, Rebecca and Isaac is going to send Jacob to Laban for a wife. You know why? Because that's the Shemite Nahor family. We read about that in chapter 27 and 28 of Genesis. When he meets, when Jacob, the deceiver, the cunning deceptor, when he meets Laban, he's met more than his match. He's a rookie compared to this master deceiver. And that's an interesting story in itself when we get to chapter 29 of Genesis, which we talked about. But here's, here's how this rubs off on children. The poor parenting rubs off on children. And it sure rubbed off on Jacob. Rebecca's influence over her son was enormous. And Isaac did not step in and do parenting with it. And you can see it. Jacob allowed his choice of a wife. Now pay attention to become an attack on the seed of Christ in the angelic conflict. We talked about this last week. This is not new. Because Jacob had 12 sons from four different mothers. Do what? Yeah, it was... There's more than I wanted to be on right there. That's at least that much. Jacob has 12 sons by four mothers who are all living in the same house. They're about. Is that not nuts? I mean, just the thought of that, it makes my stomach queasy. Now the question is, which mother will bear the seed of Christ? See, that's the problem he's got. Which mother is going to bear the seed of Christ? Yeah. See, last week we discovered and answered that. Matthew 1, 2 tells you. Genesis 35, 23 tells you in genealogy. These are genealogies. But here is the, here is the one I really like. It's Genesis 49, 29 through 33. It is the burial site of the patriarchs. 
and buried in this patriarch cemetery are the mothers of the seed of Christ, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. See, at some point, God has to overrule bad decisions. And he does. And that morning when Jacob woke up and there was Leah, he should have changed his entire course because that was a plan of God. Nobody, Leah didn't plan that. Jacob didn't plan that. God planned that. And he just wouldn't settle for what God had given him. He wanted something that he wanted. God gave him what he needed. What would be best for the plan of God, he gave him. And would have been best. Rachel never loved him the way Leah did. Scripturally. You study both those women? And we talked about her kids every time she had a kid with him, right? Talked about trying to gain the love of this man. It's just interesting. I'm just giving you a lot of stuff to look at. It's pretty interesting. You're going to have to read a little bit if you're interested. Four, the fourth generation curse was directed towards parenting of believers regarding the spiritual training of children. Some theologians refer to the fourth generational curse, generation's curse, as culpability, meaning blameworthy for di divine discipline. The pivot of spiritually mature believers carry the responsibility of custodianship of evangelism and the word of God to the next generation. I'll tell you, I, the, I, I was already in... Uh, out of my theological training when I was introduced to Bob Thiem. About a year or two deep into that, I, I was now traveling uh, with the Graham organization doing other things and studying, studying because I traveled so much, just studying like crazy on, on, on tapes, just studying everything he, he said, everything he said. I, just, I couldn't write anything, so I just had to absorb it. Just absorb it. But I studied so much. You know, the earplugs ain't going. Uh, and one of them, when I, when I got through about three years of that, um, I knew I had the gift of, I knew I had a communication, but by the end of that thir third or fourth year, I knew that I was a pastor teacher and I knew exactly what I was going to do. I knew that I had to be a a a a I, what we call ice teacher for a pivot. I knew it because I saw it in him. I saw what he was doing in a pivot because I was one of those people. I was a pivot guy. And when, when I heard that done, I committed myself to be that pastor. And listen, I am so thankful for that because when Bob died, I was, I I, I was in full steam. And I was d as deeply committed as he was to keep a pivot alive and strong to be the custodians of evangelism and the word of God. And when I mean, I don't just mean going talking about Jesus. I mean having a correct gospel and mechanics of salvation. I'm talking about the whole shooting match. Now, Bob didn't select me to do this. And I don't select somebody else to do this, but somebody else has got to take that on. It's not me. I just have to be faithful to show them what it is. And somewhere God is going to click in somebody's heart. That's what they need to do. But I'll tell you what we need to be sure we do. Listen, there is no doubt. Listen, this was the last place that I ever wanted to pastor was Birmingham. There's so many churches in this place. I mean, you can't go anywhere without running through four or five to get to anywhere. I mean, this is the most church place I'd ever been in in my life. And I was thinking that God would send me to some place <laughs> that actually 
didn't have so much churches, like maybe send me back home. I knew there, I mean, I knew there was, I I walked past a school, my high school, I walked, I I lived a block from the high school, my last two years in, in high school, my family moved off the farm, I walked past, I walked a block from my house to the, to the school, North Muskegon High School, and never knew I walked past a church. I walked past a little Presbyterian church stuck back there, cute, I had no idea it was even there. After I got saved and went back home and I said, I was saying uh, to a friend of mine, I said, you know, it bothers me that there's no church in Muskegon, in in, uh, North Muskegon where I lived. It bothers me that there's no church. He said, what do you mean there's no church? There's one of the oldest church in the area is in North Muskegon. I said, where? He says, right next to the school. I said, "Uh, I I can't believe that. But I, I, I said, okay. So I, first thing I do, uh, I get in my car and I drive down to see where that, I got to see that. I never saw it. I walked past that. I, for two years, I walked past that and never knew it was there. Now, it's not their fault. But if you're not looking for something, you don't find it, right? If it had been a, if it had been a hamburger joint, I would have known where it was. If it was a bowling, hall, a bowling place, I would have known it, or a pool hall, or maybe even a bar. I might have been interested, but the church... I walked past that thing every day. I couldn't believe it. Sitting back, it wasn't right out on the street. It was set back a little place. It was cute, little white church. It looked, you know, it looked like typical. I guess I don't know, but the pivot, uh, the pivot is what's important. The pivot, the pivot, and you you always move it. And so, what happened to me? Listen, what happened to me is I knew in my heart when I when I when I left Graham, I. I had, I had a lot of opportunities to go to a lot of different places because I knew a lot of people. I'd been all over the United States. I knew a lot of people. A lot of people knew me. And um, and I just couldn't get away from Birmingham. And so, you know, I started bringing my ministry into Birmingham and just going like, well, I'm just going to do what I can until I find a church that wants me. And I had all these college kids and high school kids. And, and God just put in my heart and said, just let's fly the flag. And so I said to a group of high school and college guys, I said, you know, I think I'm going to, I'm going to plant, what do you think about me planting my flag in Birmingham? Let's teach this stuff. See how many other people are interested. You, you interested in this idea? And they said, I don't know, I guess, maybe. I said, well, okay. So we set a date down to, to for everybody to come. If you're interested, show up at this, and if enough people come, then we'll sit down and be serious because, you know, in a meeting, everybody, yeah, 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 and then a day later, the guy like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we had a meeting, and, and, and the, church, the church was born that day. It, it's just, and, and boy, was God ever right to plant a doctrinal flag in Burma. There are a lot of churches but there are few that teach the word of God that, that know how to develop a pivot. A pivot's what's going to rescue your, your nation. It'll be a pivot. We see this doctrinal principle of preparation of the coming of Christ in the four gospel. For example, Gabriel gives a message to Zechariah. You remember the father of John the Baptist while he was on, on duty. While he was on duty in the temple. And regarding the coming birth and the ministry of John the Baptist as the forerunner of Christ. Don't you know that was an exciting day? You can read about it in Luke 1 and 2. Because I'm going to tell you, when you read Luke, when you read Luke 1 and 2, you meet a lot of the people that were members of the pivot. They weren't the majority either in Israel. They were the minority in case you think you have to have a majority. Listen to what Gabriel told John the Baptist's father. I, and this is important to, this, to my subject matter of the second covenant. I will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. That's what John the Baptist's responsibility or mission was. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, Christ, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, watch this, to turn the hearts of the father's parents back to the children and disobedience to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Do you know why the pivot's important today? you know why I crank it out and do what I do? To prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Is it coming again? 
and we need to be prepared for that. We need to get as many people prepared for that as we can. Chuck Farmer used to say, well, listen, we got an ark big enough to take everybody who wants. We got an ark big enough to take everybody who wants to get on the boat because judgment's coming. And so that's the, the importance of a pivot, in my opinion, the importance of this lesson tonight. Let us close in prayer. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way with us by internet and automobile. We are a pivot, and once they jump in with us, we'll, and they can become a pivot wherever they are in the world. They don't have to come to America. You can develop your pivot. You've got to take some responsibility. Stay with me for a year. I will help you. I will progress you along with that way. Come to our Tuesday night study. Come to Wednesday night. Drop in on Sunday morning with us. We will help you get off, get onto our all the material we have on, on the doctrinalstudies.com. Father, we need to build pivots in all these nations. We need to build pivots around the world because the Lord is coming. We need to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. And so we are a pivot. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.